19 games into the season and I'm still having struggles knowing how to judge this team. What's your problem? They're over 500, right? Well, technically, yes. But if you add on overtime and shootout losses into that regular loss column, the Preds are technically one game under 500. Certainly, I will give you this. They certainly made up for that terrible West Coast CMA road trip by doing so well in this five-game homestand. But now, right before Thanksgiving, where their minds are probably going to be at, they're going to have to go on the road to Detroit on Wednesday. Hopefully, their minds aren't on all that home cooking. They're going to be eating good Thursday night. Preds tie the Arizona Coyotes 3-3 Monday night inside Bridgestone Arena. And then after overtime, it still was 3-3. And then everybody's hands go whoop way up as the Nashville Predators defeat those very same Arizona Coyotes by a score of 4-3 in a gimmick known as a shootout, winning the game by the exact same score. This game should not have even gotten that far, but the Preds played a classic trap game to their advantage, and even though it was very stressful on the fan base, they get the job done in the end and get the valuable two points that they're going to need if they want to get back into the playoffs come April. I don't know how many of you have noticed, but the Preds are playing the Arizona Coyotes for the first time since game 82 of last season. Remember that one? Remember how they had a 4-0 lead in that game and were well on their way to facing Calgary in the first round? Or possibly, even if they hadn't pulled the upset, they would have probably won at least one game and then they proceeded to lose the game 5-4 in regulation. Not just Pepperidge Farm remembers that game. I remember that game. Why does this team always love to play down to Arizona and make the game so much more stressful either in Nashville or whether or not they play in Scottsdale or Glendale or Tempe or wherever they're going to be playing now? It's psychological and it drives me crazy. When the lineup announcement came out earlier today, it came as no surprise to me and it should come as no surprise to many Preds fans who saw it that Connor Ingram, who the Preds lost on waivers when Lankinen was announced as the backup when he tried to send Connor Ingram down to Milwaukee, that he was lost on waivers to a team like Arizona. So that when Arizona came to Nashville for the first time this season, that Connor would indeed get the start. Thanks to Emma Lingen of the Nashville Predators social media pages, that this was Connor Ingram's first ever start in the regular season inside Bridgestone Arena as he would go on to drive the Preds crazy on the ice making 42 saves by the end of this game. If this was a regular process, not just by Preds PR over who the three star selections were, Ingram definitely should have been one of the three. Because early, the Coyotes were making a parade to the penalty box and on the first two tries, the Preds got nothing. But as the old saying goes, third time's a charm. About six and a half into the first period on that third power play chance for the Preds after Nick Smokes got called for elbowing Ryan McDonough. Preds are on the power play and shortly into that power play opportunity, you've got Roman Yossi who gets the puck over to Phil Forsberg with the one-time blast right on Connor Ingram and it hits him causing a rebound, and guess who's there to clean up the garbage? Johnny on the spot, Mikel Grenland, after Connor Ingram cannot corral the rebound, he bangs it home, giving the Preds a 1-0 lead. Preds would get more chances in that opening frame, but couldn't get any more by Connor Ingram, and you would be surprised to know the Coyotes actually outshot the Preds in that first period, 12-11, to even though it looked like the Preds had the majority of the chances, but they do maintain the early one nothing lead after the first 20 minutes. Just over four minutes into the second period, McDonough would take a puck to the mouth and he would have to go off. Eventually, along with Tanner Janot, would, would handicap and shorten the Preds bench and would eventually cost him. But fortunately for the Preds, both players would later return to the ice for this game because all hands on deck later on in a third. Despite overall in that second period that the Preds would outshoot the Coyotes by a total of 13 to 6, you wouldn't be able to tell it because the Preds let the Coyotes hang around and hang around. And at one point, with about 9 minutes into the middle frame, Dante Fabro pinches a little bit too much. Coyotes have numbers going the other way, and Lawson Krause has the puck. He's able to beat Soros, 
tying this game at one. Soon after that, during a game stoppage, Kara Hammer from Bowie Sports interviews Preds assistant coach Dan Heinon, who pinpoints the problem with the Preds at that point perfectly. They seem disinterested. He points out they're not playing with enough juice. As we all know, he's not referring to the juice in that. He's referring to the fact that the Preds are taking the Coyotes very, very lightly. And it doesn't change at first because the Coyotes keep pushing. And despite the fact that Maselli gets a close call by hitting the post behind Stars, the Coyotes fall up. They're crashing in that with chances and Bukestad is able to give the Coyotes their first lead of the game. They're up 2-1. Preds have a great opportunity to tie this game with about 90 seconds left in the second period as Roman Yossi pinches, gets it out front to Matthias Ekholm and he's robbed by Ingram. As nice as I like seeing those two with a chance, I don't want to be seeing it consistently. They're defensemen. They should be setting up and shooting from the point. I want the $8 million men on this team to be creating the chances down low, not pinching defensemen for if the puck gets loose and goes the other way, who's going to be back checking? Time ticks down and after 40 minutes, the Coyotes still have their 2-1 lead. As I mentioned earlier, Tanner Janot and Ryan McDonough, who both got hurt earlier in this game, would return for the third period, and that seemed to give the Preds the jolt it very much needed. The Coyotes take a penalty early, Marcelli for tripping Carrier, and the Preds' power play would go to work. Early 30 seconds into the power play, Ryan Johansson on the left wing board to Connor Ingram's right, gets the puck over to Captain Mike Captain number 59, Rowan Yossi with a blast and goes straight through into the net. The Preds have tied this game back up at two. Oh, but the Preds aren't done there. Not even 30 seconds later, they're attacking into the Coyote zone again. You've got Colton Sissons who has the puck. He's got a defender with him. He fakes like he's trying to get Connor Ingram to bite, but you know what he does? He toe drags just enough and he gets it back to a trailing number 95, Matt Duchesne, who has all day, puts it into the net, stamps this game, giving the Preds a 3-2 lead. Whatever was said in the locker room at a second intermission, it was just what the doctor ordered. The Preds seem wide awake. Now they're finding their stride back in the lead. Hopefully not taking this game for granted anymore. Reds would get a couple power plays to extend their lead, but they're not able to convert. Hopefully it won't cost them. Nope, it does. The Preds take their foot off the gas and Vamalka, who gets called for high sticking Tanner Chanel. The Preds are on the power play, but they're not able to convert and they take their foot off the gas and the Coyotes go the other way, a two on one. You've got Nick Bustead with the puck. He keeps it, he shoots, he scores high, stick side, pass. You see Soros tying this game at three. It's all showing that even if you massively outshoot your opponent, all it takes is one to square a game even again and put the pressure on who you think is statistically the better team. I think in the final minutes of this game, leading up to three minutes left to go in regulation, that maybe the Preds would earn another power play and finally be able to put the Coyotes away. Nope, it's the Preds' turn to take a bad, inexcusable interference call by Zach Sanford, and the Coyotes would get a beautiful chance to try and get both points in this game, and the Preds get nothing. But fortunately, the Preds don't overthink it and are able to kill off that power play. One minute left to go in regulation. Time ticks down and we're tied at three after three. And I have to say, if that penalty that was totally inexcusable and right for the refs to call on Sanford gets him scratched on Wednesday, I wouldn't mind it. Reds would win the first possession in overtime and with Yossi, Johansson and Forsberg on the ice, the Preds try as they might but can't get the puck past Connor Ingram. The Coyotes get a great chance going the other way, soon to be returned by Roman Yossi who goes right in and Roman Yossi thinks he scored. It sounds like it went off the goalpost but Bally Sports never provided a good replay to know if it actually did go in the net. Eventually, play goes on and just under three minutes left to go in overtime. You've got Lawson Kraus who gets a penalty for holding Matthias Ekholm and the Preds go to the power play. The Preds would keep possession of the puck during the Coyotes penalty kill almost exclusively in the Coyotes zone and they can do almost everything. Not get the puck, get out, get 
looks, get good passes, get solid looks on Connor Ingham. They can do just about everything but poke the puck in the net. The Coyotes kill off the penalty. The final seconds tick down from the fourth period and we're off to the gimmick known as a shootout. First up for the Preds is Mikel Grenlin who toe drag goes backhand but can't beat Connor Ingram and then Nick Smoltz and Sarles matches Ingram save for save in the first round and we're scoreless after one. In the second round, Matt Duchesne is able to beat Connor Ingram almost the exact same way he did in the Preds last shootout in Vancouver. He waits long enough for Connor Ingram's five hole to open, but Nick Bustad says, no, I can do you one better. And he waits for Sarles to go down sliding and gets the puck over his left pad and these two teams are still matching each other now 1-1 one, one after two rounds of a shootout. Bill Forsberg is up and he gets Connor Ingram to buy five hole but he fakes him out and is able to get it up over the pad and the Preds have a 2-1 lead after their third shooter. Can they finally get a stop and win this game? Nope, the Coyotes aren't dead yet because Clayton Keller beats Soros five hole. It's the fourth round, so hey, let's go to Old Faithful that never fails even though he noise the heck out of opposing goalies. It's Ryan Johansson and the slow Joe. Slows right down, keeping his momentum going. Gets Connor Ingram down and out and is able to tuck it home, giving the Preds a lead once again. Sudden death, forcing Nick Ritchie, nope, he scores. Then in the fifth round, Roman Yossi isn't able to score, followed by Marcelli. And in the sixth round, John Hines thinks, hey, maybe Yusuf Parson can score in his very first career shootout attempt. Nope, he stopped by Connor Ingram, followed up by Travis Boyd. And you see, Sorrow says, nope, you're not getting one by me. And then the seventh round, lucky number seven. Somebody who has tried so hard to stick with an NHL roster who this season has not had a shootout attempt, but John Hines points to number eight, Cody Glass. Cody Glass comes right in on Connor Ingram straight away. He doesn't really make a move. He takes a shot that lifts and it hits Connor Ingram's stick side arm as Cody Glass proceeds to skate by all the press and he doesn't score as he sees that it hits Connor Ingram's arm ticks up and is in the net. The Preds have a 4-3 lead in the shootout. His first career NHL shootout goal. Can the Preds finally get a stop and win this seemingly marathon shootout? Shane Gossespierre is up next for the Coyotes. Saul says, I got this one. He makes the save. The Preds win the shootout 4-3, winning the game by the exact same score. I don't know what it is. The Preds always seem to play down to inferior competition whether at home or on the road with teams like the Arizona Coyotes or the Phoenix Coyotes before that. Fred's five game homestand ends with a nine out of a possible 10 points which is exactly what you pretty much needed to run the table after your terrible West Coast CMA road trip. Now the Preds go to Detroit on Wednesday before being off for American Thanksgiving and then they play the likes of Columbus and Anaheim during a three game homestand after that. If you want to keep this momentum going in the total of these four games, the road trip up to Detroit and a three game homestand, this team needs at least five out of a possible eight points, if not more to feel comfortable going into December. So that's it for this video. Thank you very much for watching. As always, click like if you like this video. Click subscribe if you really like it. You can find my social media by clicking on a channel name. Tell all your friends about Perdemption. And I think I have repeated this quiz many times this season. So it's bare repeating once more. Coach Hines, please play the kids like Glass and Parson much more than just the shootout. They will bring this team success. I can feel it.